Welcome everybody in the videos of chapter 23 of the Crystal Clear Electronics 2 curriculum. The lead presenter today is Szabolcs Verév, who is an assistant lecturer in the Power Electronics Research Group at the University of Technology and Economics in Budapest. Hello everyone! Standing beside me is Karoly Puka, who graduated from the same university as an electrical engineer in 2021, and since then is using his skills learned from us in archaeological research. We have already met in the laboratory, right? Yeah, we have! Have you ever wondered how much human civilization has evolved, from recording data on stone tablets to semiconductor silicon-based technologies, yet how much more fragile and exposed these newer technologies are to environmental disasters? That's right. Well, partly. Because if you think of papyrus, for example, they were quite easy to destroy too. Maybe the biggest difference now is that we have the possibility of storing the same data in multiple locations, in multiple copies, in multiple storage places, so that if there's a natural disaster or some kind of impact in a particular location, that copy might be destroyed, but we might have other copies in different parts of the world somewhere. You can think of a cloud service provider that does the same. There are servers in different parts of the world where somehow the same data is stored in multiple locations, so somehow the information can still be recovered. Well, it could be a problem if there's a flood all over the world at the same time, but then I don't think that that's going to be my biggest problem, that I have lost some pictures of my cat from my phone. In this chapter, we will examine what hides underneath the SD card's case, and how we can use it with an STM32 microcontroller. Moreover, we will implement a simple application that will save data. Okay, now it's time to sit down at the table, and let's get started with today's topic. The reliable storage of data has always been a big issue in human history. In the beginning we used stone tablets and paper scrolls, later the pages were bound together to form a book. As technology has evolved, different solutions have emerged. With the advent of the computer, digital storage of data became particularly important. The first hard disk was introduced in 1956 with a storage capacity of 3.75 MB, using 52 spinning disks with a diameter of 610 mm which were difficult to transport because of their size. The portable floppy disk with a capacity of 80 kilobytes was introduced in 1967, followed by the compact disk, better known as CD, in 1982, which could store 700 megabytes on a 120 mm diameter disk. The DVD was launched in 1995. The most popular version had a capacity of 4.7 gigabytes, all in the size of a CD. In 1999, the first SD card appeared, which already offered semiconductor-based data storage with a capacity of 64 MB, but in a much smaller 32 by 24 mm format. The acronym SD comes from the term Secure Digital. There are currently three physical sizes in use, known in descending order as SD, Mini SD and Micro SD. At this point, the question may justifiably arise. What could be in an SD card? At first glance, it might look like a piece of plastic. As you can also see in the picture, in fact we are talking about a silicon-based flash memory chip with a control chip and tiny wires hidden underneath the plastic. The control chip ensures that the SD card is an addressable memory for the developer. You can think of the SD card as a large spreadsheet, where you can write data to a cell in spreadsheet and each cell has a unique serial number. As we learned earlier, Communication protocols have a physical layer and one or more software layers above that. The physical layer describes the signals between the two parties, the voltage level at which the communication takes place, and so on. If we look closely at the bottom of the card, we can see eight copper contacts. Each SD card can operate with two different communication protocols. One of them is the well-known SPI, and the other is SDIO, SD Input Output, which was designed specifically for SD cards. Given that SDIO is the default mode, and our microcontroller includes an SDIO peripheral, we will only deal with this protocol in the following. We have summarized the functions of the contacts in this table. In both modes, the supply voltage must be connected between pin 4 and pin 6. You may notice that SPI communication requires fewer signals, so if the number of microcontroller pins is the bottleneck in an application, it may be worth switching to this protocol. 
the SDIO interface is basically a synchronous, non-differential communication operating at 3.3 volt signal level. The CRK contact must be used by the embedded system to generate the clock signal, the maximum frequency of which depends on the SD card being used. In practice, the procedure is to initially set the clock to 400 kHz, as all SD cards are required to support this, request the supported speed from the SD card, and then adjust the clock frequency accordingly. The CMD pin is used both to send instructions to the SD card and to receive responses. The data to be stored or read out are flowing through the lines DAT0, DAT1, DAT2, DAT3. The SDIO peripheral can operate in both 1 and 4-bit modes. In 1-bit mode only DAT0 is used, but in 4-bit mode all four data lines are used. Of course, this also means that in 4-bit mode four times the data rate can be achieved at the same clock speed. This makes it a good choice but it is not necessarily supported by all SD card types. Even a brief description of the physical layer shows that the configuration options are quite tricky and varied. This is even more so in the software layer of the protocol, so we will not go into detail. A new question might come to mind. How will we be able to communicate with the SD card? The answer is simple. We will use a software library that has already implemented this part of the protocol and provides us with a simpler interface based on function calls. One relatively important detail to point out about SD cards is that they are block organized. If we use the table analogy, a cell in a table does not store one byte of data, but more than one, and this is called a block. The number of bytes per block depends on the type of SD card. It is 512 bytes for the SDHC or SDXC cards we use. For us, this is important because blocks have an address, meaning that we can read or write 512 bytes at a time. It's also worth noting that flash memory has a limited lifespan, the number of writes is the main factor affecting its lifespan. In practice, they can endure 10 to 100,000 write cycles, but this number can be much lower for some SD cards. As an embedded software developer, it is important to keep in mind not to write a given block many times, as the 10 to 100,000 write cycles apply to each block. In other words, if you accidentally write the same block 1,000 times per second in an infinite cycle, you could destroy that block on the SD card in 10 to 100 seconds. I think at this point we have all the theoretical knowledge to use an SD card with our development board. In the next video we will continue with this. Meet us there too. Bye. Bye.